There's an old saying that goes, the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. Dostoevsky put his own spin on it when he said, a society should be judged not by how it treats its outstanding citizens, but by how it treats its criminals. And here in 1990's Cyber City 080808, we are presented with a dystopic world where the most dangerous jobs, usually given to trained police officers or government officials, are instead forced to be performed by incarcerated men. For every Class A cyber criminal that is captured or retired, the state is prepared to reduce the sentences of the participating prisoners. They are classified as cyber police, and given the full jurisdiction and authority to act as they see fit to ensure their mission's success. If they refuse to participate in the program, they are guaranteed to spend the rest of their lives behind bars. In this way, they are offered a kind of limited indentured freedom that most would take over the option of a solitary life in prison. While operating within the service of the state, while also not on missions, they are allowed the freedom to live more or less normal lives. They can have their own apartments, do as they wish with their limited free time, excluding illegal activities as well as drinking alcohol or partaking in other legal or illegal drugs. With the insurance policy that if they ever try to drop off the grid or disobey a direct order from their state handlers, their heads will be blown off by the bomb collar strapped around their neck that also operates as a GPS tracking device that is equipped with a communicator that is always listening to them. It's anime cyberpunk suicide squad with some running man flavoring, but that isn't a bad thing. Which is a concept that honestly makes a hell of a lot more sense through the lens of cyberpunk fiction than it ever actually has through a superhero one. People have joked for years that it makes no real logistical sense to send Harley Quinn after Superman or the equivalent. But one augmented cybercop locked into a deathmatch with a similarly augmented cybercriminal for the political whims of their government is a much more even playing field. Once the mission begins, there is a timer placed on the detonator of their collar to ensure a speedy and successful result. Each episode depicts one such mission, where we see a future where the cops hide in skyscrapers and see crime as mere unpersonalized data on screens. A future that involves convicted men being given guns to go carry out the dirty work of the government in the poverty-ridden streets. As our main character Sengoku puts it before almost executing a man, I'm not a cop. I'm a cyber criminal doing a little community service. This is the type of story that cyberpunk as a genre is best suited to cover. Which, if you aren't aware, is a type of speculative science fiction that was born in the 1960s, but really came into fruition in the 80s that is concerned primarily with concepts of criticizing capitalism and tied to ideas of societal collapse at the hands of the corporate elite. It was constructed in direct opposition of the optimistic Star Trek-styled utopian science fiction that featured humanity at their peak exploring the stars, curing diseases for the good of the people and not for the profit that it would bring, and building a society for all to flourish within that allows for everyone to have what they need to survive with dignity. In cyberpunk, man never made it to the stars, because within capitalism there is no justification to do things for the good of doing them, but instead only is driven in the direction of how much money can be made doing it, and in that they didn't have a reason to explore beyond the solar system because empty space can't be exploited. In most tales, the furthest we ever made it was Mars, and that was often done to build off-world slave labor colonies. Cyberpunk often deals with worlds where the government has little to no actual real power, because of the sheer financial level that these companies operate at. They have grown to the point of being beyond regulation. A world of extreme poverty where everyone is being exploited for what little they have left to give. And at the heart of that is the reoccurring theme of rebellion and pushing back against those trying to keep the status quo. While oftentimes expressing the futility of how slow a process like that can and will take. It also stylistically is based around science that has progressed to the point of being able to augment any part of the body, where limbs can easily be replaced with machines, and the limits of what is and is not physically possible have become a blurred neon hellscape of commercialism. It can, and often is, paired with elements of strong body horror that are the results of science pushed to the boundaries of contorting what is possible for the human form to take, as well as internalized body horror that comes from invasive software being installed into the body that changes the functions of the brain and how the mind works, changes how people are able to think. The worlds presented are often hypersexualized and are filled with forms of high and extreme fashion, mixed with 
cybernetic body modifications that are done for purposes that range from being practical, defensive, and cosmetic. And here in Cyber City, you really get a strong blend of cyberpunk body modification, as well as grounded and realistic portrayals of how this might actually play out in real life. The first criminal we encounter has face modifications as well as a prosthetic gun arm. The first humans we are introduced to in this story show that this is possible within this world, but also are unusual and somewhat taboo. It is actually a bit of a problem that I have with a great deal of cyberpunk media, and that whenever you see a crowd of people in this type of world, everyone usually has extreme fashion in their day-to-day -day life, supporting all different kinds of body mods to suit different purposes. Everyone is involved with the sexuality of body expression to a degree that would never happen. In fact, the sad matter of it is that for every one person looking like this in the street, there would be another 10 Puritans arguing why this is wrong and why they should show modesty. And I understand the appeal of this as an artist and a creator. It gives the opportunity to show off a lot of different unique designs that are really fun, with lots of poppy colors that present a world that has become truly alien to the viewer. But to me, it always begs the question of, is this how this would actually go down? Even if these types of things were possible, they, to me, would never catch on as a popular thing to do to oneself. If given the option, essentially no one would actually turn themselves into Atom Smasher. Most people on the planet today do not have the modern equivalent of cyberpunk body modifications, which is tattoos. More have piercings, but only in socially acceptable places. And many of those that are interested in tattoos, like myself, do not have them because of the cost associated with them. They are a luxury item to have, and cyberpunk is supposed to be an exploration of the desperation that results from extreme poverty associated with a world run by giant conglomerate megacorporations. And so to me, there has always been a cognitive disconnect there between the visual style and thematics of cyberpunk. And while I love the look of most cyberpunk media, and that I understand that this is done for an intentional stylistic narrative purpose that isn't necessarily intended to be realistic, which is fine, the idea that every character in these worlds would have these types of extreme body changes and fashion would in real life be pretty unlikely. The fact of the matter is that a lot of people are either kind of boring or prefer not to be noticed, and would never be interested in doing that to themselves. And I love that Cyber City is a form of cyberpunk media that takes this into consideration. Because whenever you see a crowd shot in this, everyone is still just wearing suits and casual business attire. High fashion does exist here, but most do not partake. The styles have changed somewhat, but in a smaller, more natural and functional way. Which makes the hellscape of a late stage capitalist city around them even more grim. Most people have just accepted their place in this world as the conditions around them have grown more and more nightmarish with time. Cogs in this giant machine of industry that is ruining their planet. A change that happened so slowly that it almost seemed natural. Which is more in line with the core ideas and themes of cyberpunk than a lot of other media presents. And here, 30 years later after this show was created, you can find a lot of modern images that have reached the Western world associated with industry today that match the corporate apocalypse aesthetic that they were going for here. And in turn, it has the added benefit of also making the well-done character designs for our main cast stand out more. When these types of body augmentations are rare to see, their impact is much greater on the audience, when we get to experience new ones. It makes our cast unique in the seas of people whose sole purpose is to be ground down and exploited in order to progress the slow destruction of their world for material gain. And this can be a tricky line to walk. This very well could have turned out badly. One only needs to look at the horrible NPCs in the Final Fantasy VII Remake that don't at all look like they fit in with their surroundings or world to understand that. But to me is an idea that really works here and I think is so subtle that its intentions might be lost on some. It is also nice to see one of the many examples of cyberpunk that comes out of Japan at this time. An unfortunate thing about the conception of cyberpunk is that it came out in a time period associated with economic insecurity in the 1980s, surrounded around the rise of Japan on a global stage. And as a result, a great deal of cyberpunk media still to this day features a world with heavy Japanese aesthetics from their in-universe economic domination, such as the Arasaka Corporation in last year's Cyberpunk 2077 which feels a bit racist because this imagery is intended to be based on fear of an economic origin, that the United States would lose their ground as a global superpower. And so it is nice to have fairly early good works of cyberpunk like this that are considered classics 
that are also done in a Japanese art form that comes out of Japan that doesn't have as much of that fear-based orientalist feel to it. Although that is still here a little in Cyber City. The city itself that we are presented with is definitely multicultural and representative of what a place like this might look like in the future, but isn't done to a comedic tropey degree of almost self-parody that a lot of other cyberpunk media has. And so instead of relying on pre-established tropes of the genre to just recreate a feeling instead of saying something new, Cyber City is able to make a commentary on the social fears of the path that Japan was on economically, with their work and corporate culture with an insider's perspective on all of that. It is less about the fear that Japan might in the future dominate on a global financial stage, and more about the internal human cost that would be associated with achieving that. The series was created by Yoshiaki Kawajiri, who is the mind behind a lot of darker horror-aligned anime that has since become cult hits overseas such as Wicked City, Ninja Scroll, Vampire Hunter D Bloodlust, The Animatrix, Neo Tokyo, and Batman Gotham Knights as well as some lesser-known works like Biohunter, A Wind Named Amnesia, and X. And I absolutely love his work, and it's a shame that he has less of a well-known name as some other creators, because he always brings a lot to the table stylistically that also has substance to back up the visuals. Say what you will about the writing in his films and shows, which is sometimes not as strong as it possibly could be, but there is no denying that on a visual level his projects are above and beyond a lot of your average anime. And that isn't to say that the writing in his works is bad, but he is definitely strongest on his visual work that breathes life into a world, and that's far from a bad thing. And that is the same mentality that he brought with him to work on Cyber City. Episode 1, Time Bomb, features the team being deployed to the offices of one of the mega corporations, as 50,000 people are stuck under lockdown in the largest tower in the city for unknown reasons. This episode, we are introduced to the concept of the show and our main four characters, Sengoku, Gogol, Benton, and their computer sidekick. But we primarily here focus on getting to know Sengoku as he leads the charge on this mission to save the people stuck in the tower before it collapses. We soon learn that the target for this attack is Dave Kurakawa, one of the lead engineers that is supposedly responsible for the gyroscope technology that made creating a building this tall possible, and that the man responsible for the attack is a ghost. A decade ago, Kurokawa pushed the other competing engineer down a shaft so that he could take over the construction of the building, as well as credit for his designs. They live in an economic system that encourages people to feel as if killing their co-workers is the only way to get ahead. But before he could die down there, Amachi plugged his body into the building's software, and through the augmentations in his body, he transferred his consciousness into the building's security system, and slowly over the next decade, took over the corporate tower even after his physical form had long died. And now Sengoku is tasked with the responsibility of getting rid of the ghost in the machine before he is able to bring the whole building down with Kurokawa in it. And this leads to a really well done sequence involving him going into the depths of the tower, fighting security systems and ultimately the new form that Amachi has taken, which is an amalgamated mess of wires that are running from the walls to his skeletal remains. It really is eerie and Amachi never says a single word because, well, he is dead. And Sengoku is ultimately just fighting a computer virus that he left behind that is physically manifesting and making these wires move. And it's an excellent fight and one of the best of the whole show. I do also love how this episode ends, as it is revealed that instead of having time taken off his sentence for saving 50,000 people and the corporation's tower by killing the virus, he actually has 10 years and 6 months added by the government for not following orders exactly as directed, even though those orders would have been impossible to follow under the circumstances of the chaos that was happening in the tower, which is a great cyberpunk idea. This is his life now. He is and always will be a pawn of the governmental system. He will never be allowed to leave this life, never be allowed to better himself. He is a felon to be used as seen fit for the benefit of those in power. There will always be twists like this in his future. Every time he thinks he's almost done, a new rule will be invented to further push the non-existent goalpost a little further down the road that will require him to capture more and more enemies of the state. This moment that is almost played for laughs is the dystopian capstone argument for this episode, that escape to a better life under this type of economic and political system is an illusion and does not truly exist for people like him. Episode 2, The Decoy, immediately follows up on this idea by starting with a man undergoing a very risky surgery 
that he is performing on himself, with mechanical arms and stolen internal police data, to try and remove the collar that's been placed on him by his government. He recognizes that this life has no real end for him, that this will be his existence for the rest of time, and is willing to risk his own head exploding to not have to endure it anymore, to live a life free of these shackles. The government believes that he is attempting this, and Gogol has been sent to take him in for questioning, but finds him in the middle of the act and stands back and watches to see if it is a success. And if it is, he states that in return for not taking him in, he wants his collar removed next. But as we can all suspect, the collar explodes mid-operation, and Gogol, reminded of his probable eventual fate, leaves the man's smoking body where he found it. We then move on to the main section of the narrative that involves a new type of crime-fighting cyborg created by the government designed to solve all of Oedo City's problems that is intended to phase out the current program of using convicted men to capture criminals. It is a powerful bioweapon wrapped in armor, and the government decides to test drive their new creation on the program's current participants. We are first introduced to it by seeing it disintegrate a man with a psychic concussive force, and Gogol is the next target that it is given. The military sends the machine after him, and the police, worried about losing their power, turn his collar on, and make his next mission objective to destroy the machine to protect the status quo. So what we have are two militarized factions of the government, sitting with front row seats watching a live deathmatch, that ultimately has the same consequence to them as a sporting game. And what follows for the remainder of the episode is an exceptionally brutal fight between these two entities that don't want to be doing this but feel compelled by outside forces. A fight that is up there and rivals the like of the Dark Knight Returns mud pit sequence, for its sheer level of violence that these two commit against each other, cutting into each other, ripping off limbs, gouging out eyes, and brutalizing for no good reason, other than they are told they will be killed if they don't. The match eventually goes in Gogol's favor, but that almost seems by chance. Neither of them really win here. The government cyborg is left without legs bleeding on a rooftop, more machine than man shaking, obviously suffering, not willing or wanting to accept its impeding defeat or death, or that its purpose and its pain was merely for the amusement and curiosity of someone with power. Our story here ends with Gogol receiving a call from his handler to say that his mission in killing the cyborg was a success, and that they would be turning his collar off until the next mission begins, as if that were some kind of reward, or that some kind of good had come from this horrific atrocity. Episode 3, The Vampire, focuses on the third human member of the group, Benton, as he is sent to investigate a series of murders that have happened around the city, where bodies have been found alone in their homes, drained of their blood. And we soon learn the culprit responsible to be a corporate billionaire that is hundreds of years old, who used his money to secretly support underground science experiments that were forced onto unwilling test subjects with the goal of unnaturally prolonging his lifespan. One of the first successes was Masuda, a woman who was successfully given eternal life, with the side effect that causes a blood disease that requires her to regularly kill and drink the blood of other humans to remain alive. And she is returned after many years to Oedo City to seek revenge on him for doing this to her, only to find that the virus used on her has since been perfected to turn him into a vampire, so powerful that he is immediately able to overpower her and drains the life force from her veins. A vampire so powerful that he can reconstruct himself after being turned into a fine red mist by being sucked out of an airlock. And Benton is tasked with entering into an impossible fight with him to kill him before he escapes the space station, hovering over Oedo. And in the climax, when Benton refuses an order, in a power move, the government uses the fear of their own deaths to motivate Gogol and Sengoku to go after him and to kill him, instead of just detonating his collar because through this way the men are forced into being reminded that they are not friends, that they are not allies, they are not a real team, and through this the police reinforces the idea that they want them to believe that the only thing they have in common is that they could be immediately ended at any moment if they do not do as they are told. Because if this idea is not drilled into them and reinforced with them, then they may realize that real power lies in solidarity. I think this episode is probably my favorite of the three. I just love Benton's character design, voice direction, and attitude on life, as well as his signature weapon of a sharp wire that he uses to sever anything that gets in his way, including guns and limbs. 
It is just a fun adventure with great atmosphere, but all three are high quality and have moments that shine with detail and meaning. And as we can see in these three episodes, they are able to really communicate some complex thoughts without ever feeling preachy about it, which I think is the benefit of writing in a cyberpunk setting. It is a style in which metaphors about real-life issues can be actualized into stylistic monsters from the future. We see a world where the ghost of a man murdered for another to climb the corporate ladder haunts the offices of said corporation, where the militarization of the police is personified in a horrific monster that is praised as the final answer to crime. A world where the corporate elite are literally vampires drinking the lifeblood of the lower class. And it makes me sad that we never got to see more of this, because this is just what they did in three episodes before being cancelled. If given an entire series, I think this creative team could have done a lot of amazing work with continuing this story, and really fleshing out Oedo City as a giant combination of metaphors stacked on metaphors that comment on current and future issues related to the unchecked abomination that is capitalism. We never learn what these three did to find themselves in this situation, and I think that's intentional. We are introduced to them, and we are told that they are criminals and that to repay their debts to society, they have to perform dangerous jobs for the government. And we look at them and we see hardened people and we are intended to think the worst of them, but I believe that is asking us to then further question that impulse within ourselves, and further ask if they are the way that they are because of their surroundings and what they've had to deal with in their lives, and that maybe what they did was not so bad, and that maybe what they did was only done in the pursuit of survival. And I think that this is one of the benefits and the negative sides of this show being so short, and that we never get to learn much about the characters themselves. And if given more time, I think it would have been brilliant for us to think that we know these people before given flashback episodes that change our whole perception of them, and challenges why we thought the things that we did when we were first introduced to them. We get some flashes of this. For a brief moment, we see inside of Gogol's home, and he is relaxing reading a book surrounded by many other ones on shelves that fill the room which doesn't initially line up with what some may think about him based on his appearance and the way that he talks. And I love little stuff like this that rejects stereotypes and forces the audience into looking at things beyond the surface image of how something is presented and beyond their preconceptions and prejudices. And I just wish the show had been longer to really develop stuff like that further, to show that these characters are in fact people and not ideas that fit a certain narrative of what individuals are supposed to think when they hear words like criminal or convict or felon. At the end of every story, each of our heroes technically wins, but in reality, they all lose. Sengoku kills his opponent and saves the tower and the lives of everyone in it, but time is added to his sentence for arbitrary reasons. Gogol survives the cyborg attack, but all that really means is that the exploitative and violent program that he is a part of doesn't become obsolete and that he will have to continue to hunt men down in the streets. Benton kills the vampire, but realizes that what he thought were his friends were really only people in the same miserable situation as himself, who at the end of the day would always choose self-preservation instead of group solidarity, not because they are selfish, but because they are in desperate circumstances. And not only this, but in all three stories, our main characters almost die in the service of protecting the status quo receive wounds that would take months, if not years, to recover from, all for the protection of the state, governmental, and corporate systems that exploited and devised the way that the society functioned to begin with. We are presented with three men who are damned, and are shown their victories that in reality only negatively affect themselves and everyone else without power and wealth. And I think at the core of this show, and cyberpunk as a genre, is the tragedy of hope mixed with the reality of how disastrously humans handle problems on a large scale. Our heroes keep doing what they do because they hope that one day they will not have to do it anymore. That one day they can be free and live respectable lives of dignity, which we all know will never happen. We are shown that anything can be possible. We have a world where science has progressed into the realms of magic where even elusive dreams that have tantalized man for thousands of years, such as eternal life, are achievable. But achievable only for the few. Not for practical reasons, but for ones devised around artificial scarcity, wealth, and power. It is a dirty mirror held up to reflect our visage back at us. As a series, outside of the thematic writing, there is a lot of great stuff here as well. Lots of attention to micro details in the animation that are really nice such as this shot where the scrape marks on the pavement are painted onto the background to give the sliding of this beam weight. 
which in turn makes the next moment more impactful because we believe how heavy this is intended to be. This drawer that is only seen once could have just had the gun in it and nobody would have thought anything about it. But the time was really taken to make it look realistic as if it belonged to a world that was lived in. The mechanics of cars are intricately modeled, and little lens flares of light when the vehicles spring into motion really give a sense of weight and life to the designs. The smoke when explosives detonate or bullets hit, the complex wiring of machinery, the flying bits of shrapnel and concrete in battles, the small way that a character will turn to indicate a complex emotion, all add to the life of this world in impressive ways. One of the things that I also love about this is how in style with the cyberpunk look the dialogue is. And what I mean by that is that every other word out of the characters' mouths is some form of edgy use of a swear. Which in other circumstances might bother me, but here is one of those great instances where the way that a character speaks is really indicative of the setting that surrounds them. The accents that are decided upon for the English dub are occasionally questionable. I don't know what I'm doing. I feel as if I've lost control of my life. I can't run you in. But overall, there was at least a distinctive tone here that was a deliberate decision, and I love how it reflects the world around them. Get lost. You wouldn't recognize a goddamn vampire if one jumped up and bit you on the end of your fucking dick. The real tragic thing about it all, as I've already said, is that it was only three episodes long. We don't have time to breathe here. We don't really have time to get to know these people other than the things that we can glean from looking at them and their surroundings and their decisions under pressure. There's a lot of ground that has to be covered in a short amount of time, and as a result, there aren't really introductory scenes to let us meet our cast. We are thrown into situations with half the necessary information to understand what is happening and told to have fun, which understandably could be frustrating for some, but also makes it feel like other great works of cyberpunk fiction. For instance, in my opinion, Neuromancer has a similar style. It just starts, gives little explanation of itself as to what or why this is happening and tells you to just enjoy the ride. But in relation to this, I think if it had been longer, we could have had something here that was still talked about fondly as a classic today. If we had had a Bebop style 25 episodes or so to really deep dive into this world and explore the minutia of it, I think it would have even been better. Because the groundwork is laid in these first three episodes to make something really special, and then nothing else was ever done with it again. And if they tried to bring it back today, and make more of it with a reboot, I feel as if the risk would be high that things would ring hollow, coming from a perspective that isn't deeply rooted in this time period, of the golden age of cyberpunk. But that also might not be the case. Maybe now is a better time than any to have a resurgence in cyberpunk media, a second golden age. There is plenty that could be said in this style from a culture that is facing a great ecological collapse. A culture that has in the past few years been in the midst of dealing with the concepts of extreme police brutality and militarism. The rise of far-right political extremism. A society where the average person is $90,000 in debt, while also in the last year four men added a collective $331 billion to their already reprehensively enormous net worth. A time where workers are striking in mass, arguing against inhumane treatments done against them on the part of the corporations owned by said men and their like, in which they work for, while also at the same time demonstrating that work is the only thing that generates actual value. A culture on the precipice of a housing crisis the likes of which has never been seen before, where nobody owns their homes anymore and instead rents them in perpetuity from large companies that charge more than real estate offices or single landlords ever would have in the past. In a lot of ways, when you strip away the veneer of robotic limbs and flying cars, we are living in the nightmare scenario that minds like William Gibson and Philip K. Dick dreamed about 40 years ago with the inception of cyberpunk. And there are artists out there who could do a lot with that through a genre lens if given the opportunity. My main concern, though, would be that we have progressed into a time where real commentary like that is no longer really possible in most forms of mass market media and that we have transitioned into a time where a new golden age of cyberpunk would no longer really be possible. As we live in a time where cyberpunk games that appear to have an anti-corporate story, which in actuality is pretty flimsy in critique, and features you working with the police for the good of the city, is made by a corporation that uses that game to exploit their workers, and rip off the goodwill that they had from their audience for financial gain by delivering an underbaked product. And where large media companies that control the message that media is allowed to present publicly say one thing in a propaganda-like style, and in private behave monstrously. 
And my big fear is that a modern take on Cyber City or really any other work of cyberpunk fiction would feel intrinsically false through most media outlets. And that in order for cyberpunk to remain feeling true and actually have a thematic punch, it would have to for a while be relegated to media such as books, comics, and other printed material, as well as independent video games, which have less media constraints placed on them in what they are allowed to say. Where actual criticism against these companies can fall through the cracks and land in front of audiences and potentially become popular ideas. And that's not to say that good stuff isn't being made and released, which was recently the case with Squid Game. But that was a laborious effort that took over 10 years to get made, and nobody thought it was going to be the big deal that it ended up becoming, and only became a big deal because it was the first thing in a long time that felt like it was actually telling the truth of what's going on in the world. By and large in the current climate, most companies that are willing to make content that criticizes these types of things are only allowing them to be criticized in a sanitized and safe, pre-approved manner that doesn't actually present ideas that could actually challenge power or the status quo. For example, in an upcoming issue of Superman, as many have pointed out, the superhero will be picketing to advocate for climate change legislation, because even he isn't strong enough to end capitalism which is driving that problem even though in reality he could laser beam every billionaire on the planet in less than an hour. It is a safe idea that promotes passive acceptance rather than radicalism and real change. It is a corporate approved safe way to publicly talk about issues in a non-way that still seems like they are doing something good if you don't think about it too much. And by its very nature, cyberpunk as a genre is intended to feel dangerous to the audience, as if it is something that they could potentially get in trouble for experiencing. The closest thing that we ever came to a continuation of this world is a PC game that was never released outside of Japan. And the window to bring back this show to continue its story and have it be authentic I worry is behind us. And is today just an unfinished feeling oddity which is a bit sad to me. Because all in all, I really like this show. I like these characters. I like its brutal honesty and ability to still have fun with that through a genre lens. I like its ability to incorporate strong horror in with its cyberpunk setting which isn't always done. And I just wish that this had been given a chance to explore that more, to really show us what it's like to live in this city, to have time to really slow down and take a closer look at what is going on here. Because for a show that is only three episodes long, it really does a lot with very little time. And like a lot of great speculative fiction, it is able to construct a mirror that reflects the horrors of the current day and the hells of possible futures.